I'm uh, Rebecca Mitchell, Chairman of the Stratum Heritage Commission. Welcome to you all, and thank you so very much for coming out this evening. On a winter evening, it's good to be, get together with friends and neighbors. And as friends and neighbors, the Stratum and Exeter Heritage Commissions were happy to join together in sponsoring this evening's program. One of our goals is to recognize the role that barns and other agricultural structures play as important elements of our historic uh, landscapes, our visual landscape. But um, uh, you'll learn from our speaker tonight that barns aren't just mute objects in the landscape. They are uh, sites, buildings, structures that have stories to tell if we learn how to look and how to listen to those buildings. And we'll learn how to do that tonight. We also want to recognize the often unsung efforts of individual property owners as they preserve these structures that in many cases no longer serve any agricultural purpose. How are we doing? Good. This evening was the inspiration of Nathan Merrill, a member of the Stratum Heritage Commission and co-owner with other family members of Stewart Farm, a dairy farm here in Stratum. Nate, ably assisted by a fellow commission member, Wally Stewart, worked many hours uh, both putting together this program, but also producing a book that we have on sale here, a local historic barn tour that will cover many of the ba barns that will be uh, local barns that are discussed tonight. I'm going to turn the floor over to Nate, who will introduce our most welcome guest speaker. Nate. Good evening, and it's great to see a fantastic turnout. Uh, I'm going to be like 30 seconds. Uh, John Porter is a renowned barn expert in New Hampshire. He's an uh, extension dairy specialist emeritus from UNH Cooperative Extension, and he is our resident barn expert in the state. He also hosts a visiting uh, ag engineer who comes to the state uh, several times a year from New York to help active farmers uh, solve ag engineering problems on their farms in the 21st century. So he uh, has a huge range of knowledge <clears throat> and tonight's focus is going to be about the historic barns. There are two books that John wrote or co-wrote that are on the table in the back that are available. One is the history and economics of the New Hampshire dairy industry and the other is preserving old barns, <clears throat> preventing the loss of a valuable resource which he co-wrote with Francis Gilman who is our emeritus Ag engineer from UNH Cooperative Extension. So I want everybody to join me in welcoming John. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nate. Uh, glad to be here. Um, I go around the countryside talking about barns, and my talk pretty well parallels the book. And I call it The History of Agriculture as Told by Barns. But tonight, uh, you're going to get a little added bonus here. Okay, this thing is uh, going to back up. Once in a while, this does this to me. Just a second. So I'll try to move to my next slide here. Oh, this isn't going to do this again, is it? Okay, sorry. We just got to get technology going. The added bonus tonight is they were custom making uh, this presentation to Stratum in Exeter. And thanks to Nate, he and I spent a day together in November, and we went around photographing Stratum and Exeter barns and... Uh, Largely due to Nate's help with the tour guide he's put together about the barns and the historic facts, we're custom making this talk uh, to this region. Now, barns have an interesting history down through the ages. Uh, they've always been kind of a symbol of agriculture and prosperity in agriculture. In fact, I sign all my books with Proverbs 9 to 10a. It says, Honor the Lord with thy substance, and the increase of thy first fruits, and so shall thy barns be filled with plenty. 
and barns were a symbol of, of agriculture and the size of your barn, of prosperity and so forth. And barns go back a long time. And unfortunately, we're losing a lot of barns. They're being torn down and uh, made into kitchens and living rooms and so forth. And so part of the barn committee's mission has been to try to preserve barns and keep them upright and going in part of our, our scenery. Fortunately, this barn had a good ending. This was the barn you might have recognized. It was on Route 4 in Chichester, crossing the Bobcat dealership. And I chased this through brokers and everything else. Francis Gilman and I wrote on a snowy day way up in northern Maine, and we found this thing, and it was reassembled. So that was a good ending, but they don't always happen that way, and uh, they end up disappearing from our landscape. And a lot of our barns are dilapidated. And a lot of them are owned by widow ladies who have maybe have been in the family, their husbands have passed away, there have been generations in the farm and so forth. And it costs a lot to take a barn like this and fix it up. And we've lost some to fire. This was in Dover, not too far from here, a horse farm. And these things are just like a tinderbox. You know, they're dry, they've been drying for 150, 200 years. And every winter, you either hear of a fire or a collapse or something, and I'm afraid we could hear some from this winter as well, the way things are going. Now, this is one of my favorite pictures that I call the evolution of barns because I don't know of a better example where you see all the styles of barns and still used for the original purpose. Every one of these barns has cattle in it. Let's see. The one way up in the corner, I'm going to see if I can get my arrow going here. Okay. To add to this, I'm red-green colorblind, so I, half, the time I, <laughs> half the time I don't see this dot. Uh, okay. But that barn up in the corner, that's your 1850s old barn. And then you've got the one uh, here. Okay, here. Okay, I can see it. Okay, here's the cow stable, the 1950s cow stable. And then you've got the 1996 freestall. And if this is a real up-to-date picture, there's a rear, year 2000 milking parlor here. But here's that evolution of the Yankee barn, the hip root 50s barn, and the 1990s freestall barn. This is the Yetton farm in Epsom. Okay, to start our story about the history of barns, and we've got to start with the old English barn. And that was the one that our ancestors brought that floor plan over with them from England and from Europe. That floor plan had been used for hundreds of years. And basically, you had always had a cow stable here, an open floor here for accessing the barn and threshing the grain. And then you had the hay storage here. That was just standard floor plan. And some of you know Steve Taylor, he tells the story that the little two by four they put in front of this door to hold the grain in was called the threshold. So apparently that's where that term came from that we use for doors. And this barn, the characteristic of an English barn, a door is on the eaves side, a low pitch roof, and kind of a subsistent size barn. And this was what our early ancestors used. And that was what they started with. There was just a few cattle. There'd be a, maybe a workhorse, but a very subsistence-sized uh, building. And then as agriculture grew, they added to these barns. And uh, you know, you'll see this little lean-to here. This often was the demise of these barns. The lean-to like this can catch snow and actually cause problems. This is a really cute little barn up in Lyme, New Hampshire. Since this picture has been renovated, and actually, it isn't as pretty as this now because of the new boarding, but that will wear over time. And, uh, and so this English barn was small and had to be expanded as agriculture grew. And then agriculture grew more, and they actually started linking barns together. And it was very common to link one, two barns together. Here, you see, somebody got off a little bit in the measurements, but not too bad. And they often would put them... Uh, 10 feet or 12 feet apart when they placed the second barn in place. Because if you left a gap, it left room for the oxen and for the Ryan bars and everything to get them in place. And then they would build a connector. This one, you can see the connector was about here. 
and they called it the dance floor because they had a dance the night they got the barn finished. But it was common to bring two together. And you say, why did they go to all that effort? Well, you couldn't go to Home Depot to get two by fours. It meant starting from scratch out in the woods. And a lot of these barns, these were so rugged, they could be pulled intact as a box on rollers. And the story was, I think this was pulled across the pond, but they would sometimes move them intact or they would tear them down and put them back up. But again, this, I'm giving you this history of agriculture. Agriculture grew and those little English barns uh, just weren't big enough. This is an English barn. I used to ride by this every day on the bus. It's up in Lebanon, up on Hardy Hill, Stevens Road. Probably one of the larger English barns you'll see. And I'm pretty convinced it had some additions. I think it could have been the front could have been added onto. And we're sure that somewhere about in here there was an addition. A very large English barn, probably one of the oldest barns in Lebanon. But again, it grew with the times as agriculture was growing. Okay, we get into the 1850s or so, and we had a change in barn architecture. You know, these frugal, wise, Yankee New Englanders, they got to thinking, and they said, why in the world are we putting the doors under the eaves and letting all that snow fall on us all winter? You know, why don't we put the doors in the end? And so this became known as the Yankee barn. It was just Yankee ingenuity. They, they deviated from that English plan and it had a lot of advantages. One is, it's very easy to add on and continue with your stable. That English barn was very difficult to add on to. You had this short little stable. This way, there's no end. You can, a lot of these were increased by a third or half over time. You also had a steeper roof and it shed the snow. And there was more storage upstairs for hay. And it was very good for, you know, you can drive the horses through. Not all of these, you went all this way through. Some of them you had to back out. But around the 1850s are when these came in with this architectural change. And New Hampshire must have had a real heyday of agriculture in the 1850s. There's a lot of these barns. If, you're, if somebody asks you to date a barn, say 1850, <laughs> you're probably going to be right 80% of the time. No, it really had to be the heyday. They, they must have been building barns everywhere. And the reason is you've had, you know, the Civil War thing kicking in, you had the railroad kicking in. A lot of things were happening that were helping agriculture. I mean, agriculture was actually profitable, you know, in the 1800s. It really was. It was a, it was a profitable thing, especially the sheep industry. So we moved into the Yankee barn, and there was a lot more flexibility, and it grew with agriculture. Just a few things to look at uh, architecturally. Uh, we call this the gunstock post. It uh, flares out at the top. And you see, the reason is, is so all these beams can come together and have more meat up here for the intersection. And then you have the side members. And uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more later. But uh, this gunstock post is very characteristic of all these older barns, both English and Yankee. And it was just a practical way of bringing this together tight and having an adequate spot for your joints. This is about the earliest Yankee barn Francis and I have seen. This is in uh, Hampton. Chet Riley owns it. And we dated this to being about 1799. And that's very early. But that shows you know, an advanced coastal region, longer settled. And they were moving to this earlier. An interesting thing about this the door isn't centered. And once I point this out to you, you're going to be craning your head around as you drive, just like I do, because you'll see a lot of these. See, the window is centered, but the door isn't. And what they would do, they would often have, these barns basically were built in what we call 12-foot bents. It was 12 foot, you know, between the beams. And so a barn was usually either 36, 48, 60, or whatever long. And almost every barn you walk into is 36 feet wide. Well, sometimes they will put a wider segment uh, on the feed side to store more hay, and then they go 14, 12, 12. And uh, in fact, Nate and I were no commenting on the number we saw in Stratum, an inordinate number of these down here. So the windows and stuff are, uh, some of these windows are in the center, but the door gets offset and the transom's usually offset. But once you notice this and look for it, you'll see quite a few of these. And it was just a way to build a little larger barn. 
Okay, we got uh, the growing agriculture, we got the, we got the Yankee barn, and even the Yankee barn is getting small because agriculture is growing. We're after the 1850s and 60s, the Civil War boom, the railroad boom. And so they started putting lean-to. It's very common to see a lean-to, and this would broadly usually be a heifer barn to grow more heifers and then the cows to be inside. But it's very common to see this. And the other thing, as I mentioned, they sometimes just plain added more bents. They put another one or two segments on here uh, to make these bigger. This is an interesting little story. This is a really cute little barn that I found outside of Concord. I even knew it existed until I did my book. And the thing that always intrigues me, it had a silo built on the end. And this farm quit farming way back in the 50s. And it makes you wonder if that short-sightedness of putting the silo maybe limited that barn earlier than it should have been because that makes it difficult to put an addition on. A lot of barns kept going by adding additions and a silo makes it more difficult and you just wondered if that maybe would have affected that. But it's a real cute little barn, a nice little silo there. Okay, inside these barns, up in the peak, you've got what we call the flying scaffold. That's what Francis and I call it. It's the, the scaffold area up here. They'd often hold the, this would be the hay wagon. They'd tie it up there in the winter and use the dump cart and then switch it off and so forth. The scaffold had different uses because in the early days, the scaffold kind of held the bonus crop. You'd fill the barn up and then at the tail end, the second crop or extra go on the scaffold. Then we brought in the center hay fork, which would go up in the peak on a track and then they dropped the hay on the scaffold and then pitched it off. And that made better use of gravity and it got the hay off to the side and so forth and allowed you to pitch. And you often left a hole up through the scaffold to bring that hay up in or the, sometimes they brought it in an end door. But the scaffold was very much a part of the new development of the hay fork to, to mechanize things and to make use of gravity. And in the 18, now again, I'm going to follow the lesson. I'm going to tell you where we're at. Now we're in the 1880s or so. And there was a real concern on the part of New England agriculture and USDA and so forth about New England staying competitive because the West was getting big, uh, the train was bringing in produce, and there were actually booklets written about how to make your barn more efficient. And it's interesting. I have a, an 18... I think it's an 1888 article that I have that was written, and it sounds like today's newspaper. It's to, it's to New England farmers, and it says, you New England farmers hang in there. That California water isn't going to last forever. <laughs> and that was in 1888. And they were promoting all the benefits of New England and fresh pastures and all that sort of thing. And so USDA and some of these places were actually giving booklets out and plans of how to modify your barn to be more competitive. And then they changed some of the plans to try to make better use of gravity. So we started seeing the drive-in barn bridge, uh, getting the barns elevated so now you pitch the hay down instead of up. Uh, there were plans on how to remove posts and put in rods and uh, support a barn with a truss so you could get the wagon turned around. A lot of those kind of things were promoted. So they were trying to use gravity to make things easier. This is another way of using gravity, and that's in the manure system. They can uh, have it in the basement, and so now you'd let the manure go by gravity here and take it out. So that was another way to use gravity. Then new technology came into these barns and actually kind of came the demise of them because these barns weren't designed to handle running water and moisture and so forth. Uh, years ago, a cow was lucky if she got two drinks a day. You know, she went out in the morning, went out at night. That was probably a pretty good privilege. Well, then we brought in water cups and you see you got the potential of water leaking and so forth and that rotted a lot of these barns. They weren't really built for that. And so that, you always look at the stable side of a barn, it's always in the worst shape. And then uh, ventilation became more of an issue. As we started filling these barns heavier and more animals and more density of animals, uh, people think that cupolas are a pretty decoration, but they had a very functional 
uh, method of using those on barns. They were needed for ventilation, and some people think they were just for the hay mow, but they actually tied into the stable often, too. And uh, it almost, I haven't been inside this one, but just looking from here, this looks like the normal channels. They, they built a channel all the way down the roof, down the side, down the side of the barn, and then you'd put a little opening in the ceiling, and they would actually vent the stable up through these, and then they opened it to the hay mow as well for ventilating the hay mow. But these actually help ventilate the stable, and this is a beautiful barn over in Croydon. I think it's been uh, worked on recently. And you talk about using gravity, you can't begin to capture the size of this barn. This is huge. In fact, if you look out this little window in the summer, you can see the Cog Railway go up the mountain. And this is up in Franconia. And this roof edge lines up just about with the driveway. You drive in right up in here, and then you pitch the hay down, again, making use of gravity, and then the cow stable is down here. A huge old barn up in uh, the Franconia called Toad Hill Farm. Okay, then we have the phenomena of the hitched buildings, the attached buildings. You maybe have heard of Tom Hupka's book. I think it's Big House, Back House, out, Outhouse Barn. I always get that mixed up. But um, he talks about the connected buildings. And before I heard Tom Hupka speak, I always kind of had the theory this was just a good Yankee idea of not having to go outdoors to do the chores. You could go out. Uh, from the house and through the sheds and never go outdoors to milk the cows. But Tom has done a lot of study on this and his theory is these buildings were sitting here and then due to the competition of that 1880s, 1890s, they needed little cottage industries and a lot of these buildings were butter rooms, wagon wheel manufacturing places, shoe shops, whatever. And so his theory is it wasn't so much a practical thing for a winter, but it was little connector buildings for making these farms profitable. And his really good argument he has, he said if this was to make it comfortable to go from the house to the barn, why in the world didn't Minnesota do this? <laughs> and I think he's got a good point. This is really a Maine and New Hampshire phenomenon pretty heavily. It's kind of a neat thing. The negative part is we don't see many of these around because if there was a fire, you lost everything. And that happened. We'd lose everything. It just happens. There's quite a cluster of these over in the Milton area near the Farm Museum. There's two or three of these. Another type of barn we talk about in our book is the village barn. Some people don't talk much about that, but it's a barn. It's legitimate. And the village barn had the uh, usual floor plan of one or two milk cows for the family, a chicken pen, a place for a driving horse, and a pig pen. A very standard floor plan. And you see some of these unaltered. A lot of these are, tend to be with Victorian homes, and that's the one car garage now. But if you can find one unaltered, that's a pretty standard floor plan because even your professional people, your doctors, your lawyers, they need a driving horse, had a cow for their family milk, and so forth. So we talk about the village barn, and that's a legitimate type of building, just really small, and generally no, never used for commercial agriculture. And then in New Hampshire, we've got to talk about the logging industry. And you don't hear much about these barns because they were homely. They were strictly functional, homely old barns to house draft horses. This is just an old square barn up in Stark. This is a great big old barn up in the, what they called the Percy section of Stark. They said this held 90 horses and 200 ton of hay. Just a huge old barn. This is gone. Most of them are gone. I think there's one in Berlin now that they're trying to restore. But in New Hampshire, I think we've got to talk about these because that is part of our agriculture. And they did have a part uh, in the logging industry. And then the thing that fascinated me when I did the book were the estate barns. Believe it or not, this barn was in Orford, New Hampshire, on Route 10, and if anybody knows the Tuller Farm, it's right across the road from Tuller's. It was called the Pavilion Stock Farm. It was owned by uh, somebody who ran uh, a retail stores in Boston. And it was common for these merchants to have their country place, and they had the best of horses, the best of cattle, the best of sheep, real show places. And on the weekend, they would have a sidecar track down in Boston 
and they'd load their family and their servants into the sidecar. And it was kind of that, uh, the, the, it's kind of a precursor to all those Massachusetts people coming up on 93. They were coming up on the train and the side in this car because they actually would hook on and bring a, a car up with their family and they would hook into these little, these places that they established that were run by managers, they were absentee owners. This is another one up in Wakefield, New Hampshire, the Bancroft Estate. I've heard a lot of this has fallen in now, which is too bad. But you see, uh, you know, this big turret in piece, and, and just, they had estimates of almost a million dollars to restore this. I mean, you can't blame them when people can't do this. It was just huge. But this goes back to a couple of, world, uh, a couple of revolutionary war buddies that went into the shipping business, and they copied this after a British a state they had seen in their shipping business. This is not a fancy, this is a Whipple farm in New Boston. It doesn't look as fancy, but it's another estate barn. And again, they had high quality cattle. And I think this is getting incorporated into some town offices now. This is a nice little barn, another estate barn in Newport. And the story is this was part of the Corbin Park. He was, uh, had the wildlife refuge over there. Uh, this used to have a beautiful cupola. I have a picture of it. This beautiful cupola is gone. But you've got the leaded windows and everything. I mean, these barns were built really nice and you know, well-to-do people had them. And I just found them very interesting as I was researching some of this. Okay, now we're, we're back on a history lesson. We're up to about 1900 now. And the government, uh, they had an idea that, that wasn't good. <laughs> they came up with the idea that a round barn is what every farmer ought to have. They ought to have a round barn, you put the hay in the middle, the cows around the edge, and that would be the real key to efficiency for farming. Well, a few of these were built, but if you know anything about carpentry, every single cut in this barn is either a bevel or an angle. It's a real complicated collar that brings it together. I've talked to the farmer that owned this. He said, I knew exactly what part of that barn to stop lugging the milk one way and switch to the other way. He said it was a long way around. So they weren't that practical. New Hampshire's only got about one of these left. Vermont's got a few. Uh, this was 1904. This was 16-sided. Uh, the owner has really kept this up nice, and he's kept one little section of the stable just to show what it was like. But these really didn't catch on. They weren't as efficient as they were uh, made out to be. Okay, back to our history lesson. Okay, you're up 1900s. Now we're skipping up. We're in the 1940s or 50s or so. And once again, the government had an idea that revolutionized barn design. And that is the pasteurized milk ordinance said that all cows must be milked on a cleanable, impervious surface. And the only thing that met that criteria was a concrete floor. Well, a lot of these barns had the stable on the second floor. So in the 1940s and 50s, a lot of barn stables moved from the second floor to the basement. Our barn at home was that way. If you go on a barn tour and you see whitewash in the haymow, you think, why in the world did they whitewash the haymow? Well, that was a second floor stable. And when this rule came in, these people just dropped their stables into the basement and put in a ceiling. But consequently, barn architecture changed forever after that rule went in in the 40s. And so now we were building uh, single floor barns. We were putting concrete floors. Uh, we had hay going up overhead. And we didn't have that Yankee style barn that we were thinking about before. And we had gutter cleaners, which needed a circular pattern. We had milk pipelines, which needed a circular pattern. And so we forever kind of started migrating to this other style. And this is another, this is a Gothic style. Once again, you know, hay is up here, cows are down here, but it's so we can have that round pattern for doing things and meet that requirement for a concrete floor. Okay, now we're up into the, oh, the late 60s or so. And I'm probably as guilty as anybody that told farmers yeah, just abandon that old barn and just build a new one. Because there was another engineering design that came in, and that's the truss roof. The truss roof meant that you could span 50 feet, have no posts, and not have to deal with all this internal structure. Because you go into an old Yankee barn, 
you're going to hit a post 12 foot in any direction you walk. There's going to be a post. So what we did, we said, you know, abandon this old barn and just go out in the field and build a new one. And you'll see that a lot around New Hampshire. You'll see kind of this old dilapidated barn, but a more modern barn out in the field. And that was just a measure of getting to more efficiency and so forth. And so that led to, led to the decline of some of these older barns. Okay, now we're up into the 70s and thereabouts. And there was another change in agriculture and in dairy farming. And that was the free stall housing. These other barns I've showed you, the cows are tied in place. They're milked in place. They're fed in place. We call it a tie stall. Well, then they found it was more efficient. Let the cows roam. Uh, these cows can roam free all in the barn. They can choose their stall. They can choose when they eat. They can eat more. They're more comfortable and so forth. And then we milk them next door in a milking parlor, which is cleaner than milking them where they live and eat. So now we changed another whole style of barn. And a barn like this, now this could be like 115 feet wide. And there's uh, three rows of stalls. There's a row against the wall, double wall, double throws here, and a scrape alley, and a feed alley, and so forth. So we went to the free stalls, and that changed barn architecture all over. The These are basically pole barns, pressure-treated posts, trusses, and so forth. Okay, so now if we really want to ruin your image of the pastoral setting in the country, and the Yankee barn, and the hay hanging out the end door, this is the newest thing in barns. Now this is the greenhouse barn, and this guy basically in the winter, this shade cloth that goes around this, and this is just greenhouse material, it's called a gutter greenhouse. And now the next step beyond this is the vinyl covering. They found these, uh, the, the greenhouse plastic didn't hold up well, and they're converting these to vinyl, and some are just plain built new with vinyl. But it's just a way to try to save some money. It also, if you're not sure how long you'd be farming, uh, you know, a, a few power wrenches in two days, you could probably make it look like this barn never stood here, and you could reclaim it and rebuild it somewhere else. It's just got some flexibility. You know, not everybody's going this route, but it's sometimes an option people are using, and we call them hoop structures now that have kind of replaced the greenhouse one. So that's kind of how this has all evolved, and that brings you up now into the 21st century. Okay, let's just back up a little bit on the architecture. I went over this uh, kind of quickly before. Uh, I have a real quick and dirty rule of thumb for dating a barn. Uh, it's kind of funny. I'll go to a farm, and you know, it'd be a good sharp Yankee farmer come out, and he'll say, "Oh, how old do you think my barn is?" You know, and I'll struggle, and I'll study, and I'm poking, and finally I'll tell him, "Oh, you know, 1850." Yep, that's what the deed says. <laughs> he knew anyways. But anyways, there's a quick and dirty rule that will get you within 10 years. If you look at a barn and all the beams are hand-hewn and all the braces are hand-hewn, you're probably into a 1700s barn and we don't see too many of those. If all the beams are hand-hewn and you see vertical saw marks on these braces, you're probably 1800 to 1830. If all the beams are hand-hewn and you see circular saw marks on here, you're probably 1830 to 1880. And if you see all sawn timber and all sawn braces, you're probably 1880 to 1910. Much after the 1900s, we started shifting to some balloon style construction. In fact, Stratum has got some classic examples I'm going to show you pictures of that they started transitioning to other styles. But that's a quick and dirty, I mean, it's not 100% accurate. The, the way you'll get fooled, and this happened to me, and the guy never let me forget it. I was over in Plainfield, and I dated a barn for a guy, and he said, you're wrong. What happened? They had a really early sawmill in the neighborhood, way earlier than anywhere around. He had all sawn timber, and it was like an 1820s barn. which is uh, uh, So that can fool you, because there are some early sawmills that were big that actually started doing that. And this is that up and down sawmill for the up and down marks you'd see. This is uh, down in Sturbridge. It actually was taken out of Bow, New Hampshire after the uh, 38 hurricane. But it's an up and down saw. It goes with water power and that, uh, they sawed the boards and so forth before the circular saw. Uh, this is that old barn up in Lebanon that I drove by every day. I just, that you talk about ventilation. You kind of joke about all these cracks, but you know, 
There's nothing much more uniform than those just little tiny cracks. And when we started adding siding and all this kind of thing, that's when ventilation became an issue. We started putting, uh, you know, shakes and clapboards and so forth. And just a little secret in New England, generally you're going to find the good clapboards are on the street side and the shakes are on the other sides because clapboards were considered a little notch above as far as milling. And you look at barns, often the street one is clapboards and the sides are shakes. So we started boarding these up and they got tight and ventilation became an issue. Okay, now we're going to do the barns of stratum. And Nate, you chime in if you see some things. So we did this tour together, and this is where I blew out my old talk, and we brought in stratum Exeter. And we're just going to take a quick tour through town that uh, Nate and I took that day and see some of the things you have here, comment a little bit. And maybe some of you have some local things, and I'm sure Nate may have some things too. Okay, one we saw was the Florence Wigan barn, 65 Squamcott Road. Uh, this was early 1800s, and once again, we've got this offset door. See the windows are centered, the door is off. That means 12, 12, 14. Uh, inside, you see you know, the, the structure here. This has got the vertical boards going up and down and the big uh, nailing purlins uh, and the big arch. of the, the thing that's fascinating about these barns is this internal architecture in this framing. And I'm going to have to move along pretty good because we have a, quite a few. We wanted to show you as many as we could. This is the Gif uh, Brown Gifford, 17 Jackrabbit Lane stratum. A uh, couple of things here. Uh, you've got the old milk room, which you know those were built on. Just an interesting thing there. Way back, the public health people said you couldn't have a milk room connected to a barn because of manure and the flies and everything. But then you picture lugging that milk in the open air to the milk room. That didn't seem to make sense either. <laughs> Finally, they let you put the milk room on the barn, but you had to have a double breezeway to do it. You had, and our, our milk room at home had that. You had to, I remember the door always hit you in the butt as you went through because you had two doors to go through to carry the milk. But you had to have a breezeway with two doors. And the door, let's see, it had to pull towards you from the stable, I think, so the flies would ride toward the stable. Because they're afraid if you pushed it in, the flies would ride into the milk room. But this was all in the code. And so they finally let you uh, put the milk room there, but you had a double doorway. Now, I think this one almost did. I'm not sure. That changed over time. But anyway, just see the internal things here again. Uh, this is what we call a pocket door. I'll show you some more examples that slid on the inside. Uh, and again, the thing that, just, that really gets you on these is this, this beautiful internal frame. We just saw time after time as we visited these barns and some of these really tall posts that went up. They have different, every builder had their different style, but a lot of these brought the big posts clear up. You're seeing the bottom uh, of uh, part of the scaffolding and so forth there. And again, I gotta keep moving. Uh, this is called the former Ernest Wigan barn, 271 Portsmouth Avenue. Uh, we discovered that uh, this L was a, a horse area, a horse stable. In fact, when Nate and I looked at it, I said there had to be a, some kind of high quality housing there, and it was. It was horses, and oftentimes you'd have a stable mate that might live in that area. And then uh, they built a 20th century addition, you know, for what we call modern daring at that time. So there's this great big addition out back that you, have, you might not notice just going by the front. And this is more modern construction with two by fours and that sort of thing. Now the Gallant Barn, 80 Winnicott, uh, Winnicott Road in Stratum, uh, late 1800s. I call this a transitional barn. This is a classic. I don't know if the owner is here. It's just a beautiful barn. But what makes it, what I call it transitional, is see, you're seeing the, the introduction of stud wall here. You're seeing kind of this bloom construction where in the old barns, everything was horizontal with vertical boards. And we saw a lot of these in Stratum, what I would call you know, a transitional construction, starting to lean toward the two by four construction. Uh, she has some side hay holes, probably were built later to get hay into the side, baled hay, because that wouldn't be practical uh, for loose hay. Uh, beautifully restored. Uh, inside these barns, you see a lot of little steps that take you either to the second floor haymow or the cupola or whatever. Uh, so just some really neat features. Okay, the Jewel Peabody Barn, 173 Winnicott Road, Stratum. 
Uh, something that really got our attention here were these horse stalls. Uh, these are special steel inserts that would keep the form of the stall. Horses have a tendency to crib and chew. Uh, these are neat little stalls here. Again, we've got this what I call transitional framing. We've got these studs coming in. And then uh, Jen Gunn supplied this special photo, a close-up of the cupola. They had this rebuilt, beautiful cupola. And uh, this barn is hooked on, so this connects to a house. But a really nice barn with uh, a lot of neat features in it. But these horse balls especially were quite interesting. This is the Goodrich barn, 11 stratum heights and stratum. Uh, this is the monitor style. And this means that the, the peak is raised up and has windows here to let in light. And we don't have many of those in New Hampshire. I've seen one in Dunbarton. I've seen one in Colebrook. And I've seen a few, but not too many. Vermont has some famous ones. There's one on Route 89 uh, south of Burlington. It's been restored. It's quite well known. But it was just another feature. You had to let in air and light and so forth. And it was called monitor. And you'll find a lot of terms in the barns go back to naval terms. You know, monitor was kind of a naval term. Uh, we used to talk about wharfins for entering a barn. That's a naval term. We talk about windlass for cranking up carcasses. That's a naval term. Scuttle hole for pushing the manure down. That's a naval term. I think barns and ships were probably the two biggest things being built by man, you know, back in that time. And it was interesting, and it really didn't hit me until I did another talk and got to thinking about how those naval terms came into the barn world. Okay, this is up the road, uh, 61 Stratum Heights, the Folsom Robinson Road, a barn, I mean. A lot of folks probably re remember Caroline Robinson. Uh, she did a beautiful job restoring this in a very practical way to be part of her farm. And this has one of the few uh, uh, surviving wooden tower silos around. And that's on the end of the barn. And inside it's been well maintained. And then uh, she actually did some internal support in the basement to support the floor and this could actually be actively used for part of her farming operation. Now there's another person farming there. Uh, this is Nick Starr's barn, 32 Hampton Road. Now we're in Exeter because I know we're, we're doing a combination here. We want to be sure to catch some barns from both towns. Uh, a couple of things about this one. Uh, it's kind of neat to see these windows in the door. Those aren't real common but it's just a practical way to get light and of course the common thing are the transoms because you figure when the farmers are doing their chores with no electricity uh, this was the only source to get light early in the morning and the late afternoon for pitching hay because these were pretty dark channels in the middle and so occasionally you'd see you know uh, windows in the doors and then you can't quite see it but this has got that more modern milk room that was there that went along uh, I contend that I think over 90% of the barns built in New Hampshire were dairy barns because dairying was on, on just about every farm in the mid-1800s to 1900. And uh, I have statistics that show there were 20,000 dairy farms in 1900. Now that includes non-commercial. The commercial ones would be 10,000. But everybody with a cow doing a little bit with a cow was 20,000. And so that's why when anybody asks me how many barns are in New Hampshire, I, I'm, my estimate is 20 to 25,000. So I think it correlates with that peak of dairy farming. And the rec we've got a research project going on right now, and it's pretty much verifying what I've been telling these people all this time. I think they're going to prove it's right, I think. But, but, it, but they were dairy. Now, some were sheep. Knowing what I know now, I think our farm at home in Lebanon had a truly sheep barn. And what a sheep barn looks like the second floor will be only hay with no sign of stanchions and the basement will walk out into the south and have bays where the sheep would have been kept. And we had a classic one at home. I'm sure that's what it would have been. But almost every barn you walk into in New Hampshire, you'll find at least six cow stalls. Yeah, and I just proved that time after time. Okay, this is uh, Warren Hansen barn. Again, another Exeter one. We want to represent you Exeter folks that came out tonight. 137 Linden Street, uh, mid-1800s. And this one, he told us, was uh, put together. There was an addition 
Uh, one of these bents was brought in to make this barn bigger. It's got a drive-in basement. Uh, you know, a beautiful barn. Okay, this is the Wigan Rains barn. Again, another Exeter one, 61 Newfields Road. Uh, this has the 1940s vintage dairy stable and a little milking parlor. And it makes it kind of unique because usually when you have a tie, we call this a tie stall, you usually milk the cows right in the stall. Now there are a few people that built these milking parlors and the owner would stand in this pit and the cows would come in up beside of them about 30 inches off from the floor so it was easy to put the machine on, you didn't have to bend over. The only thing is the combination of a milking parlor and a tie stall barn is the most inefficient way to milk cows there is because you're handling the cows individually in here and then you're chasing them in here and bringing them back where you could have milked them right in line. But it does save your back and your legs. Nate. John, just so you know, uh, John Rains is appraising dairy farms. So in the summer months, the cows outside the that's a good point. Thanks for adding that. And that does add a little more logic to that because now he can bypass all this stable and just bring them through. But this is a real early vintage milking parlor. These are actually grain feeders that he would probably bin to himself and have a bin of grain here and put it in. And the, the grain feeder would be the divider between the cows and they would walk through head to tail. And a, a really nice a barn floor. You know, this is really quite a nice barn. It's got a silo and so forth. Okay, this is the Pearson French barn, one, uh, 16 French Lane and Stratum. It has a mix of hand-hewn and sawn timber. Uh, poor condition right now, hopefully it can be repaired someday. Uh, the gable end has bird houses, little bird housing places. And I, I was done some in these old barns. They were trying to encourage the birds to nest and they would uh, you know, pick up the insects and eat insects in the summer. And a lot of barns, you'll see the ends will have built-in bird houses kind of in the end of the barn. Okay, this is the Jones Barn, 18 Winnicott Road, Stratum. Uh, classic mid-1800s, traditional frame structure. Uh, you get the offset door again, 12, 12, 14. Uh, again, you've got the clapboards on the street and the shakes on the back and so forth. Uh, and a cut granite foundation. I, I tried to limit myself to one slide on most of these barns and not that I'm trying to give them more coverage, but we were able to get some really nice indoor shots. And you can see this beautiful cut granite. And this has been mortared in here. It gives you also a look at what some of this internal roof structure sometimes is. And again, different builders had different ways of doing it. Uh, this is the, uh, this sliding door. They actually had support wheels, which you don't often see. This was a pocket door, which meant it was stored within the barn. But these little wheels guided it. And this is the scaffold. The scaffold area was a little strange on this one. And we're not sure. Some things may have been modified. It's not the way you'd normally see a scaffold. But uh, we got some, some really nice interior shots here. So I gave a little extra coverage to that one. Okay, the Odell Lester Barn, 148 Portsmouth Avenue, Stratum. When you drive by, and I'm trying to, I'm not picking in front of the owner, but you drive by, the front looks really good. But it does have a few side issues. And one thing, just to mention quickly, is getting trees and any kind of vegetation away from barns. Probably 50% of the issues with old barns are caused by trees and vegetation. The, the top limbs scrape the roof, side rim, limbs scrape the sides, the roots undergird the foundation, and they, it just, it really deteriorates a barn. So that's one of the quick things I tell people on a barn, get the vegetation away from it because it holds moisture and it causes the beams to rot. Okay, then we've got the C.V. Scammon Barn. This is the Doug Scammon Place, a very well-known one in town, probably the most visible historic barn. Uh, it's got windows on the north, which is very uncommon. You wouldn't normally see this in a barn, but probably it means it was part of the 1940s poultry boom. And you'd see a lot of these barns converted to some second-story poultry. Uh, it's got, uh, it had the cow stable and so forth. 
And then you probably all noticed their new barn. And this really is just a sign of the times and staying competitive. I know sometimes people get critical when they see all these changes on these farms. You've got to do it to stay competitive. They were sensitive to the location. You can see that barn is out back here. But now they have a nice clear span steel building because this was so inefficient. Uh, the only thing that happens, and, and I hope they'll have to be careful of the same thing, when you start abandoning those and they don't have an economic return, that's when they tend to go downhill. And that's what's happened to a lot of these barns. The reason a lot of these barns are going downhill is they aren't part of somebody's income. When they are part of somebody's income, you keep them up. And a lot of these barns have outlived their usefulness. So the people that are keeping them up just love their barn. And you've got to be creative sometimes to find a use for it. What we often tell people, if you're getting into the beef business or something, don't put the beef in the barn. Build a three-sided pole barn, but use your old barn for either your farm store. People love to go into these and look around for your farm store or your hay storage. But I really, I almost encourage people not to put animals back in here, but find a creative use because of how much animal use deteriorates barns. Okay, this is the Stewart Farm, the Merrill family, its last remaining active dairy farm in Stratum. This is just a classic New England farmstead in its day. Uh, Nate shared these photos with me. I just think they're beautiful. Uh, that's, probably, that's your lane leading into the farm, right, Nate? Okay, here's the beautiful tree-covered lane leading up. And this was quite a, a complex of buildings, which was common. I mean, Chris, I think this was a, a better-than-average type of farm in its day and the things that it did. But still, a lot of these old farms were pretty sufficient with a lot of outbuildings. I know our farm at home, we had a, a big corn barn. We had a water tub barn. And we had a storage barn. We had a chicken house. Sometimes it was a blacksmith shop. These were almost a, a little village in itself. In fact, I, I kind of kid Nate when I drive into the yard. I feel like I'm going into you know, the Stewart clan village there with all the houses and everything. Because it, it's a lot there. And that was part of these old farmsteads. So a lot of their original barns are gone. But the older homes are there. Here's some of the older buildings. And again, you can't really criticize people for that because they've got to do what it takes to be competitive. And if they were still trying to survive in these old barns, that open land on that farm wouldn't still be there. And just like our ancestors, those old Yankee barns weren't kept the way they were built in 1850. They had a side addition, an end addition, a piece added on. You know, they did whatever they could. And they'd probably be telling us, if you can uh, make a living and do it, with something more efficient, you better do it. And so they've done that. You know, some of these barns have been replaced, and now it's what it looks like, an aerial view. Now we're looking at these modern freestalls. Here's one of these fabric type buildings. This is the freestall with the drive by feeding and so forth. You know, you can feed 150 head in the time it used to take to feed 30. You know, you just can't compete with that. It's because they lend themselves to mechanization. Okay, well, we, any, uh, Nate, you want to make any comment on the Stratum Exeter tour or anybody else? Because we're going to move on to the other part of the talk. I'm, I'm trying to get this wrapped up pretty soon here, but I took a little extra because of Stratum. A anything you want to add, Nate, on our tour? And you've got a little booklet now that pretty puts this together. You want to just write? He did a great job on this. <laughs> it's a nice documentation. Uh, Nate let me edit it some with him, and it's a nice collection of things about this area. So anyways, that, I just wanted to customize this talk a little bit because this was a special Stratum Exeter. Now I'm jumping back into my normal talk again. And don't fear, I am getting close to the end, OK? I don't want to keep you too late. OK, so now the last part is on barn preservation. And part of the mission that Francis Gilman and I have as we wrote the book and as we give these talks is to challenge people to maintain their barns. And it doesn't mean you've got to spend $100,000, but it means you've got to keep up with things because you let little things go and you're going to lose the whole thing. And so part of our mission was to get people to think about preservation and, and renovation. 
And so uh, I, that's so I keep that in mind as we we go. In fact, we had to change the name of our book. Our first title was Barn uh, Restoration. And somebody said, well, that's actually a notch above all this. That's bringing it back to absolute purest form. And we're not expecting you to do that. In fact, we changed the title after somebody criticized that to preservation. It's preserving it, maybe not taking it to the nth degree of what it was before. So this is what happened. This is a barn that's 1,000 feet down the road from my house, or it was. And I drove by it almost every day. And at first, a shingle a tube blew off and nobody fixed it. And then the water ran down and then the plate got weak. And then the plate kind of gave way. And then the vertical studs kind of got weak and they rotted a little bit. Then the water got into the foundation and that gave way a little bit. And this is over, I don't know, probably 20 years, I don't know. And every time I gave this talk, I said, you know, this barn isn't gonna be around much longer. Well, it isn't. Now it's nothing, it's not a real special barn. It was an old potato storage shed. But it's a classic example. If somebody had put a piece of tin on here 20 years ago, that barn would still be standing. But this is so porous that when you let them go open like this and don't fix it, they go downhill. And that's why we tell people, don't worry if it doesn't look good. If you've got to put a patch on or an odd board or an odd piece of metal, just do it. Because if you start leaving things open, it's going to go downhill really fast. And you haven't got to be a purist. I mean, this is a purist. This is a lattice under work and special wood shingles. I mean, this is the nth degree of doing a, a shingle roof. But you haven't, you haven't got to go to that degree. This is expensive. The historic people, and I'm sure Beverly would agree with me here in the room, they're fine with metal roofs. In fact, metal roof is going to buy a lot more years than shingle. And we're looking at preservation, and metal's going to do that. In fact, if a lot of metal roofs hadn't been put on after World War II, we wouldn't have the barns we have today. There's a lot of World War II metal that kept a lot of buildings going. And, and today, with all these different shades, and I don't know what they all look like, teal and all this stuff, you know, you can get all these shades of grounds and greens and stuff, and you don't get that glary look. And any historic person is going to be fine with that. And it really works good, and it sheds the snow better. This is actually Caroline Robinson's barn, and she had some uh, wall issues that she couldn't 100% address. Whoops, here, sorry. So she just uh, put another course of support parallel to the sills and got the support she needed without dealing with a whole lot of issues in the wall. So, I mean, those kind of things can be done. This is back to Chet Riley. This is that real early Yankee barn I showed you in Hampton. And he and his son-in-law uh, literally went around piecemeal and, and learned how to do things. You can see they're leaving a gap, a, a, a joint here ready to accept another piece coming in. And they went around and did theirs themselves. The only caution, and the contractors always tell me to say this, and probably Ed's thinking the same thing back there, if you've got a barn that needs a lot of jacking, uh, you've got to be careful you don't start doing all this piecemeal thing before you get it straight. And also, do all the jacking before the roof is done. Once a roof is on, it works like a web, and you won't be able to jack very well. So know what you're doing, but you can do things piecemeal or by yourself or learn how to do it or not have to do everything all at once. You can get into a $50,000 renovation project pretty quickly. And it can be as ugly as this, just plain cables. And I probably shouldn't tell this little secret because it's going to blow your, your thought of this, this scene that you look at all the time down here on the coast. But this is the inside of the old barn on the wagon farm in Durham. You know that picturesque little barn on the hill? That thing is patched together with cable. But I don't begrudge that. It's still there. And you put the cables, you put big nuts on, they put big washes outside. And I don't begrudge that a bit. It's held the barn up. It's not pretty. It gets in the way. There are also ways of putting rods and things that are, are more realistic and easy to work with. But I'm not going to criticize anybody from doing this if it's kept the barn up. Okay, this is the culprit. And you see a lot of this. 
you know, all this brush, this is what's going to take this barn down. You know, a morning of chainsaw work, and you could save this barn. But you can see, this stuff rubs the shingles, this rubs the side, these roots are going into the basement. Uh, I've condemned a lot of Aunt Lily's lilacs, I tell you. <laughs> There's be some little lilac on the corner, and I said, it's got to go, because it just holds moisture and it hurts the barn. And ventilation, either leaving doors open, windows open, or putting in ventilators, they've got to breathe. And even keeping the floors clean. There are still barns around here that have the 1940s poultry manure on them. They really do. And just getting that stuff out, if you're storing cars in there, get the liquids out. And just keeping up with things uh, will help. And then just shoveling, and this is a classic here, I, I'm just showing how you need to shovel off these lean-tos. When I, I was finishing up my book and I was riding up through the Plymouth area, uh, no, the uh, Wentworth area, and I saw this and I went driving up to the guy's yard and I was so excited, you know what I was so excited about? I said, this is classic. I mean, you just, the snow was literally going from one roof to the other and I was so excited to get the picture, but it just shows the, the weakness of a lean-to and how these things come down and crash here and how you need to keep up with maintenance and summer and winter clearing and so forth, and you know, especially this year as we deal with snow loads. And I think if you're lucky, that's it. So, thank you. <laughs> So let's do a few questions. I probably breezed over something you wanted to know. I tried to allow some time for that. Ethan said we could do that a little bit. So does somebody have a question? I'll repeat the question so you can hear it. So just fire it out to me and I'll repeat it. Yes? What were the reasons for whitewashing barns? Okay, what were the reasons for whitewashing barns? Once again, the U.S. government. It was the PMO, the Pasteurized Milk Ordinance, that said every year you had to whitewash your barn, and whitewash was made up of flour and starch and creolin and uh, all kinds. I actually had the formulas in my office. Sometimes people call for them, but it, it was a mixture of some antiseptic type stuff like creolin or some things like that were used as a base and some starch and everything so it would stick. And so once a year, and this is what was my job on rainy days in the summer. Any rainy day, my father gave me a broom, and he said, start sweeping down for whitewashing. Worst job we had. You'd sweep it all down, because whitewash kind of chips off. It's not really like paint. So you'd, you'd brush it all down. And then years ago, there were these jobbers that went around all summer with this old whitewash. You'd always tell them coming, because they were all spilled white all over the truck with a great big barrel on the back and a big pump and a great big hose and a nozzle and they'd go through and spray your whole barn and that was required for sanitation and cleanliness. A miserable job and miserable the first day it was done but a nice finish and smelled nice once it was there. It had a nice fresh smell to it. But it was a public health thing. Okay, next question. Yes. Well, Slate, and maybe Ed can add to that, he's a contractor fellow, but first of all, I mean, Slate was very durable. It did add a lot of weight. It added a lot of weight to the roof, and it could be the demise if things weren't kept up. But um, I would imagine they, they tended to be on the ritzy barn, so I'm assuming it was kind of expensive. It was very durable, very desirable, but very heavy. I don't know, Ed, do you want to add to that? Yeah, they're slow to put up too, because you've got to, you know, put them upright and make sure they overlap right. Nate. Yeah, the slate barns in that slideshow have They tend to be the higher class barns, tend generally. Generally, your old cow barns had the cedar shaped shingles, and those lasted longer than some of our asphalt. I mean, we had a barn at home that was probably shingled in the 40s, and I think it was just shingled again a few years ago. It was amazing how those, because see, 
Your cedar back then was better, too. You're into some really good stuff. Right now, the, the wood isn't as good. So anyways, they tend to be, I think, more ritzy barns, not your average barn, generally. Okay, next question. There's a question nobody's asked yet. Okay, go ahead. Oh, yeah, right. And uh, if somebody poured, at some point, somebody poured a, a thin concrete uh, floor in it, what would it have had? Would it have had a, 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 a well down there for, for water to keep the milk? Uh, no, no, there's a couple different things. There's two ways to build a milk cooler. <clears throat> One way, and the University of New Hampshire, I have the plan for it, you actually poured a wall with cork in the wall and you put it a little bit lower so that you actually lowered the milk cans down into a water cooler. Mm -hmm. The other type, you bought a commercial cooler that sat above the, the floor and you literally had to have a stand that you'd go on. You had to lug these cans up onto a stand and then get on the stand and plunk them down into the cooler. And these built-in ones, which you might have had, uh, were really good. Our, our farm had one. I, I found the plan for it right in the UNH plan service. But they literally poured them in place and then the cooling was done by what we would call ice bank. They had these plates across the back and refrigerant going through the plate and then the ice would slough off during the day and go into the tub and that's how you cooled the milk. So the option would either be a separate commercial you know, what we call a milk cooler that would be self-standing and you'd have to lift cans way up into it, which is a lot of work, or custom-built you know, concrete in the floor. Yep. Okay, next question. We got a few more minutes. Yes. Uh, our barn has a uh, pit toilet right in the middle of the barn. Um, it looked like there was other manure in the basement. From, would it be typical for people to be working in the basement and someone just using a pit toilet? For <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> you see a few outhouses in barns. Generally, the outhouse was in the connector building. Yeah, this is right. Yeah, we, we have that. Yeah, we have that too. But, but right in the barn itself, it, was a, it just empties into the basement. But the basement was a, was a full basement, so it was used. So was it a separate little room, like an outhouse? Or? It was a separate, but it, was, but it, was in, it wasn't sticking out from the barn. It was right. like a separate closet. Yeah, separate closet. Yeah, closet. right. Okay. And it just had a hole that emptied into the basement. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the day of that being used, I mean, you just plain have a manure piles down there, and probably people wouldn't be walking in that vicinity and have a surprise going down to the basement. <laughs> uh, I'll just give you a little bit of outhouse trivia. <laughs> I know a lot of people, they get fascinated by a three-holer. But if you know anything about outhouses, you know why it was a three-holer. It wasn't like mom and dad and Junior went to the bathroom together. <laughs> if you know anything about outhouses, by December, the first hole was packed up almost to the seat and you moved over to the next one. <laughs> that's the outhouse trivia. A lot of people, are, but that's the, you know, I mean, if you've, you know anything about outhouses, I mean, it builds up and you've got to move over and that's the practicality of a multi-hole. It was, a lot of people get a big chuckle out of you know, how did the whole family go out there? How did they have three people out, <laughs> out in the outhouse? So that's a little outhouse trivia. And my other talk I have, I go into that a little bit more, but I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> okay, another question. Yes? I have an old, my house in 1798 were up in Kingston, and there's a barn attached to it, to a mudroom. And I think the barn was just used as a stable. I don't think it was a dairy barn. Well, it depends on your topography. In fact, there's a barn that I looked at <clears throat> outside of Durham, I think it was, that's built almost over a ledge. Because generally, I mean, these farmers back in the 1800s didn't want to pick the good land to put the barn up. I mean, land was hard to come by and hard to create and hard to clear and so forth. And so barns were sometimes built over ledges and rough ground and everything else. 
And sometimes they were built very shallow over what was underneath them. Now some had basements, but if you go poking around on some of these, sometimes it may have been rough terrain or whatever, and sometimes some of these support beams sit almost on the ground. In fact, over time, things build up, and those can be some that you know, sometimes will rot. But I would guess that maybe that was built on rough terrain, or for some reason they didn't build a, you know, a basement. And uh, it's not uncommon to see a barn built you know, very close to the ground with just barely clearance on some of these support members. And I've seen some literally on ledges. Okay, another quick question. We've got for a couple, three more minutes. Yes. Okay, you asked one of my questions I was waiting for. You, you baited me. It's funny, Francis Gilman and I wrote our book. We're good friends, we've worked together for years. I had him in class when I was in college. We get along great. And the only argument we had writing the book was about what you build a barn out of. And we were in his little cottage up in Maine. I remember distinctly working on this chapter and we were coming to about how, what you use for barns. And I was kind of arguing, you know, chestnut, beech, or whatever. I grew up in the kind of River Valley, and we tended to see more hardwood. Francis says, no, John, it's not right. It was hemlock or pine. And you know, so we're kind of spatting back and forth a little bit. And finally, we just sort of chuckle at each other. The correct answer is whatever was out in the back 40. <laughs> because you weren't gonna haul in wood to build this thing. You were building what was out back. And to answer your question, the pine was probably preference for the ease you know, of hewing. But on the Connecticut River Valley, I've seen a fair number of oak and beech and chestnut and so forth. But the correct answer is what was in, you know, on the farm because you're not gonna go off site to get it and you're gonna use what's there. So I would say probably the easier hewing was a preference, but it could affect the species you have in the neighborhood. But it's interesting you brought that up, because I have to always chuckle and ask, and ask, because Francis and I had quite a little battle about that, and then we just had to chuckle about it. There's still another question you haven't answered, I asked, I mean, go ahead. Right, okay, no, good question. Now, the reason you saw a lot of recycling of timber is, like I say, you didn't go to Home Depot when you wanted to build a barn, and if a barn was getting in bad shape or too small or whatever, you would tear it down and reuse it. And there's two big clues that when this happens, number one, you see notches that don't have wood in them, you know, nothing coming, no timber coming, so you know that notch wasn't needed and probably was in a previous piece, the other big clue is you're apt to see Roman numerals where the joints come together of matching numerals so they knew what piece went with what. So it was very common to do that. It was just a practical thing. You see it a lot. I mean, invariably, you see it in a lot of barns. You know that that was brought in. Rather than starting from scratch, they brought in something that was deteriorated and couldn't use the whole barn. They used pieces or whatever. But it was just the practicality of not having to start from scratch. And it was done a lot. But the, the, the unused slots in the, in the notches and the Roman numerals are big clues. There's still another question you haven't asked yet that I expected. Any other question? Nope, everybody's trying to guess what that question is. Okay. The question that usually comes up, which I really don't cover that well in my talk, is about silos. You know, people wonder about that. Now, silos started out generally internal in a barn because people were concerned about the silage freezing and they didn't have really good methods of cutting it and so forth, and they felt it was in the barn, it would help. And the early silos tended to be square silos within the barn because the square construction was easier to do. Then they started developing more milling techniques and they had beveled notched lumber that could build in a circle and they would put internal silos. 
and a real clue of an internal silo is a dormer window on a barn roof, because otherwise there's no need of a dormer window on a barn roof. You see a dormer window, that was the entry point to put the silo blower in to fill the silo. Our barn had one at home. So as time went on, the milling got better and they built the round ones and then they felt comfortable putting them outdoors and so forth. And then the other thing that limited silos was just the, the mechanization for properly chopping the feed and getting it in. Because in the early ones, you know, they were using all kinds of one-lungers and conveyor belts and all kinds of stuff to get that silage in. And then later, we had more mechanization <coughs> and stationary cutters and things to do it. And the silages started kind of in the 1880s or so. If any of you have heard of the Hordes Derriman magazine, Lorraine used to write for it. I have original minutes of the Granite State Dairyman Association, which Cynthia's dad was very involved in. I have the original you know, charter minutes, and it talks about, I think it was 1890, H.W. Horde had a big meeting in Concord and talked about making silage and feeding the cows and everything. So that was a big thing being talked about in the 1880s, 1890s. It was a very desirable thing, but the mechanization and cutting was a limiting factor. And then the other thing that killed silage was the, the farm wife. Because the early silage was grass and they weren't wilting it. And when it fermented, it, 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 would, it gave off butyric acid, which has kind of the similarity of sour milk and vomit. <laughs> and they said that the uh, New Hampshire housewife was probably one of the leading causes of silage not progressing, at least the grass silage, because they wouldn't let the husband in the house. So, but you know, corn silage came around and then finally grass silage got reinvented about 1970s. When I came on the job, I, my first duty was going around the countryside telling about making wilted hay crop silage. And it had a comeback and now everybody does it. But anyways, the silos, that, that question wasn't answered. It often is asked and a lot of your barns, you know, may have had one or you may even see a, a covered foundation because sometimes they put in a floor and you'll see this little rock foundation. You wonder, what in the world is this little rock foundation doing in the middle of my barn? And it was probably the silo. So that was the one you didn't ask. So, so now you've got it. <laughs> is there another? Wrap-up time? Yes. Uh, when, barns, when you first started farming, I presumed that it wasn't corn silage that you started with. Right. New Hampshire was one of the leading wheat states until we discovered Kansas. <laughs> no, there was a lot of grain grown in New Hampshire and they were self-sufficient and they were growing wheat for the cattle, for grain, and the barleys and the oats. Very common, it was very common for a farm to be growing you know, grains. But the basic ration on the farm would be to grow dry hay and then it would supplement it you know, with these grains. And Chris, to now, now we've gone to the silages and we purchase our grains because it's so ex we can't get the yields per acre you can in the West, and we're better to grow our forages and bring the grains in. But years ago, they were self-sufficient, and you'd see granaries on a farm, and they'd have wheat, and oats, and so forth. I guess we're about it. Okay, and just a, just a really quick advertisement for Beverly. She's back there selling books. And she has my barn book for sale and also my dairy book. And the thing I say about the dairy book, that's what happened inside of the barns. It, it really is. These were all dairy barns, and we did a lot of work on that dairy history book, and that will tell you what these barns were used for. So if you want to see her, you can get kind of the summary of what I just talked about. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, before you leave, I also want to remind um, any barn owners out here that both Stratum and Exeter have adopted what is known as RSA 79D, a state law that authorizes towns to grant property tax re uh, relief to barn owners who can demonstrate the public benefit of preserving their barn. I won't go into all the details of that. In fact, Beverly has information about that back there, and also you could talk, we have some on our Heritage Commission table as well. 
I also want to point out that um, our Stratum 300th Anniversary Committee here is selling fundraising um, merchandise, and we'd appreciate you uh, stopping by their table. Um, one last thing, uh, our janitor kindly put all these chairs up for us today, and if you could pitch in and fold your chair, and if the line's not too long, stick them up on the rack there, we'd appreciate that um, getting cleared out of the room. Um, but lastly, I really want to thank John Porter for being with us here tonight, and thank you all for coming. Thank you, John. Thanks.